we are looking forward uh, with a courageous hope to see what God has in store as we continue uh, to walk through this season. For many of us, we know uh, this is a hard season. This is a, a, a very uh, trying season. I know for many in the medical field and others, as far as teachers and others involved, it's, it's a trying uh, season for us. But I know that God has got this, and he's going to continue uh, to guide us and lead us no matter uh, what our struggles are, our concerns are as we walk through this season. Uh, I think Brandon did an amazing job. Pastor Brandon did an amazing job bringing the word last week. I didn't get to uh, be here, but we watched. I watched online uh, this week and just kind of caught up on the message. I thought it was good. He did an amazing job of opening our eyes uh, to the truth. Uh, the truth is that our death, right, reveals uh, what we truly are and who we truly serve as we look at that. But, but it's not just our death, and I think he really did an amazing job of laying it out there that it's also uh, our life, right? It's how we live our life, how we honor God with all that we have. And so I want to build on that uh, today as we kind of walk. Uh, listen to Pastor Brandon's words uh, last week. He said, this ultimately is what we can take away from the story of Stephen. It is an incredible story of courageous hope. In the face of unbelievable suffering, even death. Stephen proved who he followed through how he lived, how he spoke, and yes, even his death. But Stephen lived the last hours of his life as Christ did. I I believe that Stephen lived all of his life once he began to follow Christ as Christ lived. And so that's kind of the hope this morning as we walk through uh, this passage of Scripture is that we would see how we can live our lives for the glory of God. Uh, the question that we ask ourselves, I, I think, on uh, a daily basis, or I ask myself, or we should ask ourselves, is what do you want for your life? Right? What do you want for your life? How do you want uh, your life to be uh, seen? What are you truly uh, living for? We can say we're living for family, we're living for our spouse, we're living for ourselves at times, but I think we should be living for the glory of God. With a courageous hope, right? With an excitement. Uh, We can put our faith in a lot of things in this world and it falls short. But God will never fall short. So whether uh, you're in this room or whether you're watching with us online, right? We have a God who graciously loves us and walks with us every step of the way. But we forget about God's grace when we are more consumed with ourselves, right? It's easy, I think, at times uh, to grow consumed with ourselves. It's easy at times uh, to think about what I want, what I desire. It's easy at times uh, to really miss all that God has in store because I'm so focused on, my mind is so set on the things of my own heart, the ways that I want to live, the way that I want to act, or the things that I want to get. The Apostle Paul would say it this way, though, You are not your own, right? You were bought with a price. The price of the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In reality, if we are in Christ, we are a new creation and our life is no longer our own. It's not about us living for the things that we want or the things that we desire, right? It's following God's plan and following what he has in store for us. And the beauty of that is as we follow God, it's not always going to be hard or easy. It's not always going to be uh, everything that we want. But in the end, we will get everything that we need, right? God will graciously carry us every step of the way. But we forget about God's grace when we're consumed more with ourselves. As we go through the New Testament and we see Christ and we see his disciples, we see Acts and all the writings of Paul and the other apostles as they proclaim the truth of Christ and who he was. In the New Testament, it's clear that God has called us to understand that our lives are no longer about ourselves, right? Our lives no longer belong to us. And God has called us Not to be mere recipients of his grace, not to just grab a hold of his grace and move on with our lives, but to truly be ministers out sharing that grace with others. And so that's my prayer this morning as we gather together is that we'll begin to see and and really grab a hold of the amazing grace of God. I love the song that we sang earlier. Uh, it, It just grabbed a hold of me. You know, I need you, what, every hour, right? I need you, God, I need you. We need God. We need his presence. We need him Every moment of every day, but we often forget that or we don't live our lives in such a way that we could do that. I I think about the early believers and how uh, they followed God. I imagine what it was like 
Imagine what it must have been like for that early group of believers, those men and women who were on the front lines, right, beginning the church. We joke about it kind of a little bit around here at times. It's almost like right now we're restarting the church and we're getting things going again and we're figuring out where we're at. But, but imagine what it must have been like uh, to be on the front lines of the beginning of the church, uh, to, to really see the miracles of God, to be a part of what God was doing. Well, that hasn't changed. We're still on the front lines, right? We're still moving the kingdom of God. We're still living for him. And so we should still be seeing his miracles. We should still be seeing his power. And we are. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, we had baptisms and just seeing uh, the power of those changed lives and how God is moving. But those men and those women who were on the front lines, they individually witnessed and personally experienced the life, the death, the burial and the resurrection of Christ, they personally experienced, right? It wasn't something that they just read about. It was something that they lived out. Now, it's easy for us, and I think at times, I, I think in my own mind, I, I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have lived that out. I wish I could have seen those things. But here's the reality. Christ is still alive, right? And we can still live in his power. We can still live in his might. We can still experience his presence, it's not something that just happened 2,000 years ago. It's something that's been ongoing for 2,000 years plus, right? And that power, that grace, that presence of God is still moving in us. It's not just a story that we read about, but thank God we can read about it. But it's also something that we experience firsthand and we live out ourselves, right? We need him every hour and praise God we can experience him every hour. You know, the reality is that to the degree that we understand and embrace the grace of God is the degree that we're going to live it out, right? I mean, basically it's like this. Those who get grace, they live grace, right? Those who get it, they, they really grab a hold of it. They really understand it. They live it. They, they really, truly know what it is. Now, this last weekend, Tony and I were out fishing and, and the kids were out there with us and our wives were out there hanging out with us and we were fishing and everything else and uh, during the course of it uh, we were reeling in some pretty big fish right somebody in the last service were like yeah they were big now if you want to know I've got pictures I'll show you later uh, but uh, they had we had some pretty big fish that we were kind of reeling in and and it kind of came to this point where Tony was like hey man we've reeled them in let's make our kids start reeling them in you know let's make our wives start reeling them in let's let them experience what this is and, and so we're like, okay. So the next one hits, and, and Tony's like, Jackson, go. And so my son jumps up, and he goes to grab it, and he grabs the pole. And, I mean, he is holding on for his life. And I'm filming it, and we're all, like, experiencing and everything else. And Junior's out there, and he grabs the net, and he's ready to grab this fish and everything else. And Jackson is just holding on. And all of a sudden, it just goes limp, right? I mean, it just goes light. He's like, Dad, Dad, the fish is gone. I said, no, son, the fish is swimming towards you. It's going to hit again. And right immediately, it's like, bam, and he caught it again. I mean, it was just on, and he fought it, and he fought it, and he fought it. And eventually, uh, he got it in, and uh, Junior helped him with the net and everything else, and he got to experience what the catch was. It's so different to experience grabbing a hold of something than, than just to hear the story about somebody else, right? You guys are like, yeah, whatever, big deal, no big deal. But, but if you were there and to really grab a hold of that fish and grab a hold of it, you know, it, it's like that with God's grace, right? We can hear the story of God's grace. We can hear the story of like, oh, it's amazing grace, and it changed my life, and it set me free, and it did all of these things. And yet, until we truly experience it for ourselves, we are not changed. But God's grace comes to each of us. And the beauty of it is, is it, it knocks us off our feet, right? Or maybe it knocks us to our feet, where we were dead without hope, without life, and it brings us to something new and everlasting. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 3. Today we're going to look at the story of a man who is just hit with grace. A man who gets to experience grace, and he experiences grace because two men, Peter and John, have already experienced the grace of God, right? They've already come in contact with what God has for them. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 1, 7 through 9. He says this. He says, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass. According to the riches of his grace, he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he has made known the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, 
which he purposed in Christ. I love this passage because what it says about grace is that God lavished it on us, right? It's not just a little bit of grace. It's not just a, a little spoonful here and there. No, it's this outpouring of God's great love and his grace that set us free from sin and death. The power of the Savior. See, God lavished his grace and his love on us. Now, we must creatively carry that grace, right, that life that we've received, that change that has uh, been made inside of us. We carry that to the world around us. And we're going to see uh, as Peter and John are carrying that truth and this man who is lame gets to experience the true grace of God. We pray with me real quick? Father, God, as we come before you this morning, we just pray that you would fill us with your grace. God, we, we need you every hour. We need you every moment of the day, God. And I know that there are those in this room that are struggling with uh, the forefront of loss, the, the, the back end of loss, God, the, 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 the struggle of life, the weariness of, of loneliness, God, the, the battle of, of, of relationship. God, there's so many hurts and needs, God. There's so many things at time that, that feel crippling to us, God. But your grace is enough for us. God, your grace comes into every moment of our life, and it frees us. It gives us the strength that we need, God. It gives us the hope that we need so we can courageously face the day, God. God, we were dead in our sin until your grace came to set us free. And so my prayer this morning as we open up the scripture, God, first that we would see our great need for you. God, let me and everyone in this room and those watching online know our great need for you, God. Second, God, let us know your great love for us and how you sent your son to die on the cross for us, God. And let us experience that grace today in a way that we never have, God, so that we would be set free. To live for your glory, God. And thirdly, God, my prayer today is that we would walk out the door with a courageous hope. Able to face any trial, any struggle, any hardship. Because we are set free by the name of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Because of our sin, because of the sin of man right in the Garden of Eden, all of us are born... Uh, with an inability to truly walk with God, right? To truly know God, to truly have that uh, relationship with Him. In the garden, we read about Adam and Eve and how they walked with God and they talked with Him. But once sin entered into that relationship, that relationship was broken. And they could no longer walk with God. They had to worship Him from a distance. But God in His great love reached down through Christ, setting us free, right? Giving us the hope that we need. When we look at this, we're all born lame and broken in some way. Uh, each of us have, have a struggle. Each of us have a hardship and a problem. We're each lost and, and searching for hope. But the beauty is that Christ meets us right where we are with that hope. Praise God that he's given us that life and that hope. That he truly uh, loves us enough to pour his life out for us. Here in Acts, we're going to see a man who was lame from birth, just as we all are, right, who is crippled from birth. Not only that, he's poor. He doesn't have a way uh, to pay for his uh, surroundings. So every day he is taken to beg. Like that, we can too relate because each of us are sinners and we're bankrupt without the Savior. We're bankrupt without God's love. But God in his love reached out for us, giving us a courageous hope in Christ, setting us free. This man is also, we're going to find in the story, he's sitting outside the temple's gates. And, and we who are without Christ are outside, right, that fellowship with God, that truly knowing him. But the reality is that God meets us right where we are. He meets us in our brokenness, in our lostness, in our, our depravity, even in our brokenness. And the beauty of it is God reaches us even when at times I feel like we're running from him, right? We're in open rebellion against him. He still reaches into our life. So look with me today at Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. 
at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter and John were entering uh, the temple during the busiest time of the day. They were intentionally going uh, during this hour, uh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They were intentionally going to the temple whenever they knew that everyone would be there praying. Everyone would be there offering uh, their sacrifices. Everyone would be gathered around. Why? Because they wanted to proclaim the name of Jesus. They were going there not just to worship, but to what? Proclaim Christ, to begin to share their faith with those around them. They they knew that that they were filled with the Spirit, and they were led by the Spirit so that they could go and just show that love. Now, the beauty of that is that Peter and John knew the full weight of God's grace, right? Let's just kind of focus on Peter for a moment because Peter is is the one that's going to be the main speaker in this, but, but Peter truly understood the grace of Jesus. You see, Peter was one of Jesus' most trusted uh, disciples. John was as well. It was Peter, James, and John that were always with Jesus, hanging out with him and everything else. But Peter had kind of this different relationship with Jesus than the other two did. And Peter and Jesus were always around each other. And Peter had proclaimed that he was going to serve God, that he was going to fight for him, that he was going to give up his entire life for him. But then Christ was arrested. And we know if we look through Scripture in the New Testament, through the Gospel, we see that Peter, at his moment where he had promised to stand for Christ, he instead what? He denied him. Not just once, but he denies him three times. The the moment where he can truly stand for Christ and proclaim his trust and his belief in the Savior, he steps away and runs and hides. Now the beauty of this is that Christ doesn't leave him there, right? We know in John chapter 21, we see the story where Peter and the disciples are out fishing. They've kind of returned back to their normal life. They're trying to get away. They're trying to kind of be on their own and everything else. But Christ, what? He shows up in that moment. Peter jumps out of the boat and he swims to the shore. And him and Jesus begin to have uh, this conversation. And in this conversation, Jesus looks him in the eyes and he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, well, yes, Lord, you know You know that I love you. Okay, Peter, then I want you to feed my sheep. And again, they're talking and just kind of hanging out, and Jesus looks at him again once more, and he says, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, that's great, Peter. Then I want you to feed my sheep. And a third time, Jesus looks at Peter, and he says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know that I love you, God. You know all things. You know my love for you is real. Then he says, feed my sheep. Now the beauty of this moment is is, is a restoring, right? A restoration. In this moment, what Jesus is doing is he's showing his amazing grace. It cuts Peter to the bone whenever he says it the third time. Why? Because it reminds him of all three times that he's denied him. And that's the beauty of God's grace is it doesn't just cover a a moment of our life. It covers every aspect of our life. Every single sin is covered by the grace of God and by the power of who he is. But we must come to him in what? Repentance. And we'll see a, a little bit more about that later. But I want you to understand that, see, grace doesn't just pay for our sins. It changes us, right? It, 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 it transforms us into a new person. As we're going to see with Peter's life, Peter who once ran is no longer going to be running. You see, living in a relationship with Jesus is our greatest blessing. So shouldn't we be sharing that blessing with those around us? If, if it truly has transformed our lives and it's truly made us new, shouldn't we live our lives in such a way that we're filled with God's grace and we're sharing that grace with all that we come in contact with. Look at me again at verse 4 in chapter 3. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his full attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. 
Listen to the power of that moment, right? I, I don't have silver. I don't have gold. But what I do give to you is Jesus. I give to you the Savior. Peter knew that his life was new. It was all about Jesus, and he wanted others to know that as well. You see, a life that is radically transformed by grace cries out for others to see Jesus. A life that is truly radically changed for Christ, it doesn't just go, hey, Jesus is great. No, it's like, hey, I want you to know, I want you to understand that Jesus Christ is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. He's everything. That life that has been radically changed, set free, runs to everyone going, hey, you can be free too. And that's the life we should live. That's the life we should be giving to to those around us. A a, a life radically transformed by God's grace, it doesn't just whisper in the shadows, it cries out in the streets so that others can know God's grace. Uh, When we experience that, our greatest concern becomes what? That others know Christ. Because we know Christ. Because we receive what he has for us. You see, the beauty of this is that God deserves all of our worship, right? He deserves our obedience. He deserves us following him. And how do we show that? The most, it's by glorifying his name. It's by pointing others to his grace. And and, and I love what happens here. Peter, in this moment, he says, hey, look at us. I I need your focus here for a moment. I need you to, to take your eyes off of everything that's bothering you and everything. Look at me. But what he's saying here is not just look at me. He's saying look at Jesus in me. You see, he's not going to give this man uh, just a small little momentary gift that's going to affect him for a moment. No, he's going to give him what? Life. Something that grace. Something that's going to change him for eternity. I love it. Peter says, he says, I have no silver, I have no gold. And I can immediately be like, the man's like, oh, great. I'm out. He starts to look away. Now Peter's like, no, 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 look at me. I don't have any silver and I don't have any gold, but what I do have, I'm going to give to you. And it's the greatest gift that you could ever receive. You see, the new life that Jesus Christ had given to Peter, Peter was now going to pass on to this man. The changed life, the grace, the power of of the resurrection, Peter was going to now give it to this man. He was going to witness to him. He was going to share God's love with him. And he does it in an amazing way. Look at verse 7. It says, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Who are we reaching out for? Who are we taking by the hand and pointing to Jesus? Who, who are we pouring our lives into su- in such a way, pouring the grace of God into such a way that their weak ankles right, are, are being strengthened, that they're being brought to life, they're, they're being brought to hope. Verse 8, he says, he jumped. The man jumped to his feet and began to walk. I love that. This is a man who's been what? Crippled since birth. And he jumps to his feet and starts walking. Now that is miraculous, right? It's not he hobbles around. It's not he tries to get. No, he jumps up and he is completely healed. And he knows how to walk. He's transformed. He's made new. He's brought to life. It says, then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. He's not just walking. He's jumping. He's praising. He's excited about I, I love it when somebody first comes to Christ, right? You see the excitement. And then we're like, my life has changed. My life is new. I'm set free. And then what? It begins to kind of fade away from some of us. But see, our life should be that way for eternity. From the moment of salvation, we should be leaping and jumping and crying out for others to see the grace of God. The grace that so graciously changed us. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement 
at what had happened to him. They were filled with life. See, Peter took him by the hand, raising him up and pointed him to Jesus. And Christ has called each of us to, to step into the lonely existence of those around. I think about this man, and I think about kind of how our world is at, at the moment, right? There's a lot of loneliness. There's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of isolation where we feel like we're on the outside looking in. But God is longing to reach into that. And who are the instruments that he uses to reach into that? Us, the body of Christ. He uses each and every one of us to reach into the loneliness of those around us and love them. Whether we're a nurse, whether we're a teacher, whether we're a mom, whether we're a dad, whether we're a, a co-worker, whatever we're doing in our life, God is using us to bring grace to the world, to bring his great love to the world. Peter, faithful to the calling of God and what God had placed on his heart, he spoke the words in what God did the work, right? It wasn't Peter that saved him. It wasn't Peter that healed him. He's going to go on and he's going to tell everybody that. But, but, but here's the thing is that it's God's power working in us. You see, the man had never taken a step in his life, yet leaping, he stood and began to walk. Not only that, but when he enters the temple, he's walking and leaping and praising. And others begin to see that and they begin to notice the change. Are others noticing the change that Christ has put in your life? They should. That's how amazing the grace is. It should change every aspect of our life. See, people should hear about Jesus by the way we speak. They should see Jesus by the way we live our lives. There's power in the name of Jesus, right? There's, there's instant healing that we see here, and that power should come out in every aspect of our lives. Verse 11 says, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished, and they came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colony. I love it. The people came running to them. Why? Because they were proclaiming and living the glory of God. That's the way our lives were, a light on a hill, right? Shining the light in the hope where others can see it and come to us for life and hope. So says, when Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided uh, to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one, and also that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is the name of Jesus and the faith that comes through him that completely healed him, as you all can see. See, if we're living like Jesus, others are going to see Jesus in us. If we're living our lives like Jesus, others are going to see Jesus. They can't help but see Jesus in us. Peter was burdened for the people. And whenever the people started gathering around, what did he say? Hey, I did a good work. I did a great thing. This guy's walking. It's great. Look what I did. No. He says, it's all about Jesus. Peter boldly lays out a message. He says, hey, you guys crucified the wrong guy. You crucified Christ who was sent to save you. Yet, his grace is still available to you today, if you'll believe. Man, what love is that? What amazing grace is that? Is Even though each of us are guilty of causing sin, Christ's death, right? Our sin caused Christ's death. He still graciously reaches for us. He still loves us. See, tragically, though, not everyone will accept the grace of God. As Pastor Brandon shared last week also, he said, you can attend church every week and still be very, 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 I don't know how many varies he used, he used a lot of varies, but very lost, right? 
You can attend every week and miss the grace of God. Look with me at chapter 4, verse 1. It says there that the priests and the captain of the temple guard, the Sadducees, came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put put them in jail until the next day. But the number of men who believed grew by about 5,000. Many believed the word of God and were saved. But others rejected the message altogether. See, as we look at this, this same mob that kind of gathers there, all of those uh, that are are gathered there arresting Peter and John, it's the same mob. It's the same mob that arrested Christ, right? It's the same mob that tried him. It's the same mob that convicted him. It's the same mob that celebrated his death. And Peter is facing the again, right? It's the same mob that Peter ran from, right? I mean, imagine what must have been going through his mind in this moment. Oh, great. Now they finally come for me. Now it's finally over. But here's the reality is that Peter doesn't run this time. He doesn't run this time. See, here's, here's the tragic truth. Not everyone will accept the grace of God. Not everyone will. Everyone can, but not everyone will. Some are going to miss it. But our job is to do the work of God. It's to share the gospel with everyone that we can, so that even though everyone might not, some will. To proclaim his truth in such a way that others hear the gospel. See, Peter doesn't run in this moment. Why? Why? Because Christ is his hope. Peter knows something. Look with me at verse 6. It says, Ananias, the high priest, was there. And so were Caiaphas and John and Alexander and the others of the high priest family. They had Peter and John brought before them. And they began to question them, by what power... Or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how we healed him, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man now stands before you. Look at verse 12. It says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. I love that word, must. Not can, not should, but we must be saved. Peter boldly proclaimed that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Basically what, Jesus, what he was saying is, it's Christ or it's nothing. He is our everything. Now, when we hear these words, they may seem a little aggressive. They may be a little bit uh, offensive. And really, truly, in a world that we live in, it's, it's not inclusive, right? But it's truth. There is no other name by which we will be saved except Jesus. Only Jesus saves. And Peter in this moment was speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was laying it out there. It's all about Jesus. And today, we have that same calling, right? We have that same message brought to us that we have to believe in Jesus. It's all about Jesus or nothing, right? And we can choose to accept that. And then once we accept that, we live that, right? We live everything for the glory of God. This is our hope. This is our only hope. 
Christ. Surrendering our life to the Savior. Truly giving our hearts completely and solely to Him. In the end, though, the Sanhedrin says nothing. Look at verse 13. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who was standing with them, there was nothing they could say, right? There was nothing they could do because if they were to say something, that would be denying a miracle that was obviously right in front of them. And if they were to agree with the miracle, they would be saying that Jesus Christ really truly is the way, the truth, and the life. And so what did they do? They did nothing. What will we do with the grace of God? Will we truly accept it into our hearts and into our lives? Allowing him to truly transform us and set us free. You see, the quickest way to forget about God's grace is to be consumed with ourselves, right? To be consumed with our own wants. These incredibly hard-hearted men were so intent on protecting their own selfish interests. They were so intent on being right and keeping their position That even when an undeniable miracle was standing right in front of them, they said nothing. They said nothing. Why? Because they ruled their hearts. They ruled their lives. And they weren't giving it over to anyone else. See, this side of forever... This side of heaven, this side of forever, we still are at war for the sovereignty of souls, right? And, and that's really what we're looking at in this moment. It's, it's who really rules our life. Peter says it's Christ or nothing. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's Christ or nothing. And in this moment, the Sanhedrin, they say, okay, then I'm taking Nothing. What will you choose today? Who will you give your life to? See, what the Sanhedrin couldn't understand was the grace that had truly transpired in the life of Peter and John and the man standing right there with him. And because of that grace, Peter and John refused to leave people Without hope, right? They refused to, to not share that. Look with me at verse 18. It says, then they called them again. And they commanded them not to speak or teach at all the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, what is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to listen to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. And we shouldn't be able to stop. We shouldn't be able to stop talking about God and the change that he made in us. Jesus in his powerful presence so saturated their lives. It it so determined their steps. It it so set their will in such a way that they couldn't help but making it all about Jesus. Jesus. And not only that, there's a man standing with them, right? And and whenever I think about the story, I'm like, man, I want to have the courage uh, of John. I want to have the courage of Peter to stand. But really, what what I need is I need the courage of the man just to stand, right? Just to stand for the glory of God. Because it's the grace of God in our lives that changes us, setting us free. And it's the standing in that grace that leads others to Christ, right? It leads others to hope. By Christ's death, by his life, by his death, by his resurrection, our lives have been infused with what? Grace. And that grace leads us to courageous hope. That we can share our faith with those around us. The grace of the cross is not just a grace that forgives and accepts us. It's a grace that makes all things new. 
every aspect of our life. And the man who was healed is standing right there the entire time. And his testimony, guess what? It's just as loud, if not louder, than Peter and John's. Your testimony, my testimony of the grace that God has given us is just as strong. If not more so because we're here right now. Where others can truly hear and experience the grace of God and how he changed us. But to share that grace, we have to first experience that grace. There's a verse that this week I was kind of dwelling on. It kind of grabbed a hold of me, and it's been kind of in my mind all week long, and it's this. It's 1 Thessalonians 3, 8. It says, for now, we live. If you are standing fast in the Lord. This is Paul writing to the church there in Thessalonica, and he's just loving on them and everything else. And basically what he's telling them, he's saying, hey, I live my best life when I see my grace living through you, right? The grace that God has given me through you. I live my best life when I see you standing strong in the faith. I live my best life whenever I share what I have with you and it carries on, right? I mean, think about that. I live my best life whenever the grace of God moves in me such, in such a way that my wife experiences it and knows it. I live my best life in such a way when the grace of God it moves through me and it's lived out in my children, in my coworkers, in those that I come in contact with. Right? That's when we live our best life. We live our best life when we live it for the glory of God. And others experience that grace and they live it as well. That's the beauty of God's love. So today as you leave, I just want to leave you with one final challenge. Stand strong. Stand strong and share the grace of God that has changed your life. Stand strong and share the grace of God that has changed your life. Because that's what this world needs most. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your word today. And God, my prayer today is that if there's someone in this room that hasn't truly experienced your grace, God, today they would know it. It's life-changing grace. It's grace that we need every moment of every day, God. And how do we find that grace? Well, first we have to confess that we are sinners. God, we fall short. There's nothing we can do in and of ourselves to save ourselves. We praise you for the grace that covers that sin. We praise you for your love that sent your son to die on the cross in our place, God. So today we confess our sins and we lay them at your feet, God, and we take on your righteousness, God. Your great grace that covers all our sins. Even as sin increased, your grace increased all the more, setting us free from sin and shame. So my prayer today, God, is for those in this room that don't know you, that they would admit their great need for you, God. And they would call on the name of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. It's Jesus and nothing else. He is everything. So my prayer today, God, is they would call on the name of Jesus. And if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, we will be saved. If there's someone in this room that is ready to do that, I pray that you would do that today. Don't run anymore. Don't try to do it anymore on your own. Give your life to the Savior. And God, for the rest of us, may we live out that grace. God, may we be reminded today of your great grace that set us free, that brought us from death to life, from hopelessness to eternal hope, God, to courageous hope to life everlasting. May we live that in such a way that others see Jesus in us. In your name we pray, amen.